Okay. I was in London for the world premiere of Something About Mary, and I had an hour to kill, and I went to the British Museum. And at the British Museum, they had an exhibit of ancient cards, like playing cards, tarot cards. Matter of fact, Napoleon hired numerous artists to depict his victories in battle. But what caught my attention at the very end of the exhibit, way in the back, was an incomplete deck of cards. And on these cards were hand-painted images that reminded me of Lewis Carroll's fairy tale, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Except these cards were dark and twisted and had this whole goth vibe going. So I became kind of obsessed about these cards. Like, where do they come from? Where are the remaining cards? And I kept talking about them all of the time. Matter of fact, I was out having drinks with a friend of mine, Robert, and um, these two girls came by, and I started telling these girls about these cards. And when they walked away, he kicked my he said, don't talk about those cards, man. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, it's boring. Like, hey, I like the cards. He goes, look, I, if you promise to shut up about these cards, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna introduce you to a friend of mine that's an antiquities dealer. And this guy, all he does is trade and collect with playing cards. I'm like, you're kidding me. He goes, so he gives me the guy's phone number and name. And when I see the name, it's Mr. Buffington. And I'm thinking it's a joke. I mean, Mr. Buffington seems like such a cliched name. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, so, uh, so I got really excited and I called up Mr. Buffington and I, I don't know if you guys, guys have ever done this, it's really embarrassing. You know when you're nervous about a phone call and you write down what you're gonna say? I was that nervous. I'm usually not that nervous. But it didn't matter because I, I the guy had a really high voice and I, he picked up the phone and I just panicked. I just went, hey, Mrs. Buffington, is your husband around? I, I, I didn't know, it was, it was this guy. He goes, this is Mr. Buffington. And look, I pulled my foot out of my mouth and I just blurted it out. I just asked him, you don't know me and do you know anything about these cards at the British Museum? And he said, the Alice cards? I go, yeah, how did you know? He goes, because I own the remaining cards that complete the deck. I went, get out of here. Where do you live? I'll be there in five minutes. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't even know who you are. I said, is there an appropriate time I could come by and see these cards? And he said, you can come by in a week for a spot of tea. A spot of tea, okay. So I show up, I show up a week later, I knock on the door, the door opens up, I kid you not, this guy with the high voice, 6'5", 250, and this paw comes down at me, and I'm like, whoa, Mr. Buffy did? He goes, oh yes, call me Dugan. <laughs> Wait a second, did my friend Robert put you up to this? Because Dugan Buffington, that's, that's too good. That, no, his name was Dugan Buffington. Again, foot in the mouth, out. He invited me in, he was very kind. Uh, we had our spot of tea, but the guy was really eccentric. I mean, he, he did the weirdest things. For instance, one moment he gets up and he walks out. He just leaves the room and, I'm, and he starts doing stuff like that. <laughs> I think I'm stepping on this cord. Um, and so uh, he leaves the room and he comes back a few minutes later and he's, he's got this big box. And I'm like, what's up with the box? And he goes, Frank, the cards you're so interested in are in this box. I'm like, get out of here. And I rushed over to the box and I go to open it and he slams the door <laughs> down on my hand. He goes, don't open my box. Freak. What's the problem? <laughs> because the story in here, Mr. Bador, that you're so interested in is not a fairy tale. In this box is the story of murder and revenge and betrayal. Can you handle that? Dude, come on, bring it on. So he opens up this box, he takes out these cards, and he starts telling me this crazy story with all these cards. And those cards and that story was the inspiration for all of these books. So this has been 10 years, I've been, uh, well, 15 years since I started writing it. And uh, thanks to Mr. Buffington. Now, I ended up buying those cards uh, with a lot of the money that I made on Something About Mary. And I don't bring them with me because they're so old, they're falling apart. As a matter of fact, I have them in a, um, a climate control vault to keep them safe. I did some, uh, I reproduced a few of them, and occasionally I bring them when I do school events. Anyway, that was the story that, got, that started me um, writing my first book. Now, The Looking Glass Wars, the first book was originally published in 2004 in the UK. Um, what happened is, I tried to sell it here and nobody was interested. And then I went to England thinking, oh, that's where the 
you know, the source materials from, and everybody turned me down except for one editor. Her name was Callie Poplack. And she, um, she, uh, she was an amazing editor, but she made me rewrite the book. It took me five years to write this. She made me rewrite it about 40 times. Not the entire book, but sections of the whole book. But she's the reason I think it became successful is because, you know, in writing, they always say is rewriting. Well, it was really true in this case. But the second book um, only took 18 months because once you create the world, the environment and the rules and the backstory, then it's, then it's about finding conflicts and um, challenges for the characters. And, um, and, then, and then I want to bring it all the way full circle to Comic-Cons because um, Comic-Con, uh, San Diego Comic-Con, was a really important event for me. In 2004, this published, and then I was, um, I'm gonna backtrack one little moment. When I was in England for the book tour, there was a kid, I went to a school, and there was a kid in the back, and he had his hand up, and I'm like, okay, 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 you, with the hand up. And he goes, Mr. Bedore, I am very upset with you. What's the problem? He goes, you didn't finish the book. In the book, Hatter Madigan's my favorite character, and he goes on a 13-year quest, and I need to know what was going on for those 13 years, because in the book, I skip over his 13 years. I just tag the beginning and the end. He goes, so you have to go home and finish the book. <laughs> you know, and I laughed at the time, but what happened is I got on the plane, and I started thinking about Hatter, and I said to myself, you know, he would make a good action hero as a comic book, so why don't I do a comic book filling in those 13 years? I'd never written a comic book. And uh, when, I, when I got home, one of my favorite uh, artists was Ben Templesmith. And so I sent Ben an email, I didn't know him, and I pitched him the story, and he said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll I, 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 I a little bit sucker punched him because I said I want to do some web um, pages, and he said, oh, sure, I'll do 10 web, web, web pages for you. And so once we started, I said, hey, Ben, this is really good, we should just do a whole comic. And so we did our first comic, and, um, and I go, Ben, people really like it. Let's do another one. <laughs> so we did another one. So we ended up doing four together. Now, when I went to San Diego Comic-Con, I introduced my story with one 30-page comic that Ben had done the work, the art. And because Ben was well-known, people were picking it up and buying it, not because of me, but because of Ben. And then on the back, I had a little ad that you could buy the UK edition of my novel at Amazon.uk. And people would come back after the first day and they said, hey, we really like your comic. What's up with this book? I go, oh, it's the whole story. And so they started buying it on Amazon UK. They bought so many copies, it became a bestseller. Then Penguin called me and, and Random House called me. Both of the people, that's my fault. I'm gonna just turn this off. Or maybe you can. Thank you. Yay. So, uh, so I can move now. Um, and uh, so they had uh, they had all passed, and now that it was doing well, they were interested in um, in uh, acquiring my book. And uh, at first they said, oh, we can't spend too much money on it. And I said, oh, that's pro no problem. And I went in to have a meeting. Now, I'd gone to, I'd gone to uh, Penguin four times. I'd been, uh, this was my fifth time going to New York, going up to the 56th floor. And my agent said, well, no, it's not the 56th floor. It's the 57th floor. I went, oh, really? I go, okay. So I go to the 57th floor. And I walk in, and there's 15 people in the room. And they're all telling me what they're going to do with my book, and they're all excited about it. And uh, I'm saying, well, that's fantastic. Uh, and they go, so do you want to sell us your book? And I go, well, I would like to sell you my book, but I have to take one meeting over at Random House after this. So, uh, so then I went over to Random House, and they had turned me down twice. Um, and on the third time, there was 20 people in the room, and they were all telling me how they were going to how they were going to sell my book. So what, what turned out to be um, uh, being rejected over and over, now I had two suitors, and uh, and they ended up competing with each other and spending money until I finally decided I thought that uh, Penguin would be the best publisher, and so they ended up publishing my book here in the states and embracing a lot of the artwork that I had worked on with concept artists that I had met, you know, working on movies and things like that. Which is, by the way, 
which was very fortunate because this book did really well because of the cover. And um, you can see it's got a little bit of Star Wars influence because Doug Chang is doing the new Star Wars movie. Um, and these two books were do done by Vance Kovac. And Vance did, um, he did uh, Thor and he worked on uh, Planet of the Apes. So, um, so I've had a number, and the poster uh, is this guy Mache, and Mache uh, is working with me on a movie I'm doing at Warner Brothers, but he's doing, well, he was working on, on Tron, but they just, uh, they, just, they just pulled the plug on that, and he also worked on Guardian of the Galaxy. I thought they uh, put that on hold for for a while. Yeah, but, but they, yeah, they put it on hold, yeah. They said, they, from what I understand, they said, we're not canceling it, but we're putting it on hold because... You know what that means? They're canceling it. That usually means we're canceling it? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it might come back. It's true, but... Um, so... Uh, yeah, so I was able to work with uh, Penguin and then start to get my, my books out. And so I really um, owe a lot of thanks to the Comic-Cons, the folks that visit Comic-Cons, the uh, patrons, because uh, without that, I might not have ever you know, sold my book uh, here in the U.S. And so that was in 2005. So this is my 10th anniversary of doing uh, Comic-Cons, and it'll be my 10th anniversary of... Um, of San Diego, so uh, you know that's why I'm here. I, I my one of the early Comic Cons I did was um, Phoenix, and it was uh, similar to this. And now they have eighty thousand people, I think. So um, so you know we all need uh, a start, and so uh, I'm happy to be here at uh, your Comic Con. So. <laughs> um, so uh, a few other things I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, I can show you some of the um, artwork if you'd like. Uh, I have quite a bit of concept art. Now the reason I did so much concept art was, you know, the world is so visual and it's so competitive and I thought that uh, readers could discover my books, one through bookstores, uh, but the art bec becomes its own portal into the story and often people will be attracted to the art when they walk by at my booth and they go, what is that? Um, and now I'm starting to do that with cosplay characters. There's been a number of people who have been doing cosplay characters of my, um, of my book and so I did something that was kind of cool. I thought uh, I want to announce my new book, which is um, Hatter and Madigan, which is a prequel, by the way, uh, Hatter when he enters the Millinery Academy. And so I brought five cosplayers dressed as my characters to New York, and I announced my new book on The View last Friday. And, um, and so, thank you. And so it, it, it was pretty fun because uh, Whoopi turned out that Whoopi is a, is a big fan. And the reason I discovered that Whoopi Goldberg was a fan is because I did a Kickstarter campaign. Now, when I did my Kickstarter campaign for this book, I was trying to raise some money for the printing. And for $500, you could become, your likeness could become a character in the book. And so somebody spent $500. Her name's Karen Johnson. And Karen Johnson's, her stage name is Whoopi Goldberg. And so Whoopi is here. And so I, I sent Whoopi a note. I said, how would you like your, your character to show up on, uh, on the stage, the two of them? That's, we'll all come on your show and we'll promote my new book. And so she said, I'll have you, I'll have you come on. So we showed up. And so I had um, Queen Red. I had Hatter Madigan. I had Whoopi's character, which is the queen of clubs. She's best friends with Red, uh, but she betrayed is read for for love and she loses her head so I was telling her that on the on, on the view and then um, and then uh, warrior Alice and her love interest uh, dodge so we all walked out on stage and uh, they asked me a bunch of questions some of which I I answered here similar like how do you get started and things like that and um, I don't think there's been a literary work that's had cosplayers. There's been a lot of literary works like Harry Potter who have become movies, 
but I think I might have been the first to, certainly the first to bring cosplayers on stage and announce a new book. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has done it, so. Uh, but I'm gonna say I'm the first just because it's more fun that way. And somebody can dispute me. <laughs> uh, so so I, did, I did that, um, and then there was a thing called BookCon, which is just for lovers of books, and there was 20,000 people that showed up over a couple of days, and I sold a lot of books there. It was really fun, and I had a couple of the cosplayers with me. So, you know, from my standpoint, you know, being an author is also, uh, it's one, you have to be an all, uh, you know, you have to be a good writer, but you also have to be able to promote your work, and it's really hard to get attention as an author, because there's so many books, and uh, there's so much competition out there and from all pop culture, um, and so, um, almost everything that I that I do creatively that speaks to the marketing is really to extend the storytelling in different mediums, but then to also create as many portals to the main story as possible. So whether I do a, a card game, or I'm developing it now as a musical, or I do something on you know Pinterest, it's all you know, or I write something for Tumblr, or I have a character who's got one of my characters have their own. Um, their own, they have their own Tumblr accounts. It's all to it's all to tell a story across multiple multiple mediums, um, because that's that transmedia approach is what I think is where we're all headed. Um, and the other great thing about it is there's not there's no gatekeepers. So you know everybody in this room who's creative and who wants to create something, you know there's a way to do that now um, without needing to wait for uh, Penguin. Matter of fact, I, Penguin is, and they merged with Random House, they're the biggest publisher in the world. And this book, I'm not publishing with them. I started a publishing company on my own. And the reason I started it on my own is I'd rather have a small sandbox, um, but be able to build a sandcastle any way I want, knock it down, start over again, and invite people in. And so uh, a friend of mine wrote a book, it's a murder mystery, it's called Static, it's a coming of age murder mystery, and it's so great that I said, I'm gonna publish this book. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll let you publish my book, but if you're gonna publish my book, I want to know that you're gonna publish your book alongside of it, that you believe in your publishing company. So I made a deal with this distribution company called Publishers Group West, and so next year, Static and um, uh, Young Hatter will be coming out, and uh, and so now uh, officially I'm a, a publisher. So I have to step up and uh, and show my friend the path, the template for how to promote your book and how to how to have some success. So so that's uh, that's my story as it stands right now. Uh, I am doing some interesting things. Um, I just hired a composer, lyricist, and a book writer with the company that did Wicked. Um, they're in New York. They're called Araka, and uh, so we're we're just starting to write songs and write the book to do a to do a musical, which would be which would be really amazing. But it's really hard, and it takes a long time. And you know, I have to hire experts surround me. But I'm an expert in the Looking Glass Wars, but I'm certainly no expert when it comes to musicals. So I have a really great book writer and. Uh, composer, so I'm hoping that happens. And um, and then the other thing on the movie front is I made a deal with uh, Chuck Roven, who did the uh, Batman movies with uh, Chris Nolan, and he did Superman, and he's got Suicide Squad coming out, and he does all those DC movies. And so we're developing the Looking Glass Wars. Now, what's interesting is I almost had this made as a movie, but then the Tim Burton movie came out, and the Tim Burton movie even though it's different, is the same. Like the pitch is a reimagining of Alice in Wonderland, a girl who's unhappy who goes back. Um, and so that, that, and the movie was so successful that that actually hurt my chances of getting this movie made. Um, and the sequel is coming out next May. So, but this story follows Hatter in the Millinery Academy with a whole other set of characters. And it's a little bit more like Harry Potter where there's a school setting and there's different, um, there's different suits so all sort of um, training um, and vying for you know power, and uh, but it's a it's a middle grade book, and so we might start with the prequel and do this movie first, and then just naturally back into in success, and I could do all these books. So, uh, but you know that's 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 
you know. Yeah, especially, if I was going to ask what do you think about the Tim Burton version, the Tim Burton read. Well, I was I could barely watch it because I was so disappointed. So it was hard for me to watch it objectively. <laughs> because, I was just thinking about how I could um, have Queen Red come out and um, strangle everybody with her uh, with her flesh eating roses, but. <laughs> Uh, so it was a little bit tough, but you know, it made a lot of money because one, it's Alice in Wonderland, it's the third most quoted literary works in the world, so it's a big brand. And then Johnny Depp as the Mad Hatter is, you know, it's just sort of a must see with Tim Burton, and it just had that perfect kind of quality of, of elements that came together. And, and by the way, the, this, the Alice in Wonderland is in the public domain, so I knew going in that you can live or die by that sword, meaning, you know, anybody can reimagine um, Alice in Wonderland, and everybody has, uh, from Gwen Stefani to, you know, to, you know, Tom Waits. I mean, so many people have found their way to Tim Burton, and so, you know, you just have to find a way into the, uh, into the, I'll have to find a way into the movie or the musical. And then in success, then I'll be able to do, if we do a good job, you know, if you watch a movie like Aragon, which they didn't do a very good job, or the Rick Reardon stuff, um, you know, there's been a lot of movies that haven't really worked, and so that kills the, the, the franchise. So, now my daughter, hey, would you stand up on this chair for a second? Okay, see, the other thing that we do is we are, because um, we don't want to wait, so this is, um, this is a, a t-shirt from the Looking Glass Wars, and these are the singing flowers that Alice so missed when she was exiled in our world. And this is um, obviously Hatter, and then if you look at the, that's, that um, Japanese sign is uh, the sign for Zen. So um, we, uh, we do a lot of things like that for fun. Um, and it's really nice to have your own world to play in. And I encourage, you know, for everybody who wants to be creative, there's lots of interesting outlets. And I often talk about the power of imagination, which is a big theme in my book, but how to empower people to be creative and find a way to, uh, because at the end of the day, if you have a story and it's finished, you can get people to it, but you have to get to the story. You know, you have to have it. It has to be a thing. And then once it's a thing, people will come to it. But if it just stays up here, then it's, uh, then it's hard to, uh, to promote it. So. so that's my story, and I'm sticking with it for now. <laughs> you guys have any questions for me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> your style of bad hatter, hatter hair. So, how do you come to it? Uh, you mean his, um, the, the tone? The, yes, the, the hat, the style of his. Well, uh, I don't know if you remember the James Bond uh, job. And, oh. uh, and uh, <laughs> I thought, well, it would be cool if there was blades coming out of that thing and it could transform. And so uh, that was an inspiration. Uh, but I didn't want him to be uh, mad, and so I wanted to play against what everybody knows. So he hates tea, he's not mad, um, and he's a real action hero. And really, if you think about Alice in Wonderland, it's very episodic, and it's about a young girl you know, um, uh, who goes on this journey, but all the stuff that's going on is happening to her. She's not responsible. I wanted to do a reluctant hero story, so Alice was reluctant but she had to become the hero. And the, so it's, it's a queendom, so women are in power, it's female lead, but the men, and all the men support her, but the men have really cool stuff, but it's her story, it's her journey. It's her going from seven years old with incredible magical imagination to being exiled, to having that taken away from her, to finding that thing uh, who she is and that power within her and to help her are all these you know these men so it's like the opposite of what happened in you know Star Wars it's it's really and so I I wanted to honor what was there uh, in terms of Lewis Carroll's um, work but I wanted to have the kind of genre storytelling that allowed for the big adventure and the testing of the character because really the plot the reason for the plot is to test the character. So you set up who the character is, and then you create the obstacles to test that that person and those characteristics to see if they can do it. And so I wanted, 
I wanted to find as many ways to stop her from becoming who she's meant to be. And then these characters come in to help her, but ultimately it's her journey. And so, so everything was, everything came out of one simple idea. And that is when we're kids, we have these very powerful imaginations. And over time, uh, our imaginations seem to dull being adults. And if we can retain that imaginative power, we can thrive and we can certainly create great art. And so uh, that's what the basic germ of a theme was. And so then I just kept adding on that and then creating plot and obstacles. So. Hmm. The, the big cards that you talked about, would you ever consider doing like a full reproduction of the whole set? Well, I don't own all the rest of the cards because they're traveling, um, but I have done some some card sets, but I haven't done a, of those. I might do that at some, with the ones I have. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of different decks of cards. People like cards. Yeah, or that would be really cool. Yeah, I mean, I did I did a deck of cards that because um, Ben Templesmith is popular. That is the is the black and white ink of each of these um, panels. I have those downstairs, which are really beautiful. So each card has art on it. So those are kind of cool. Yeah. Um, the inspiration for, I guess, the glow. Was this a, did, you, did, did that come from something else, or was it just uh, an idea that just came up? You know what? Every once in a while, you have to take some mushrooms to figure stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that was just an inspiration uh, because I was looking for something that would allow Hatter to have a trail to follow and he needed something and so the idea that really imaginative people have a glow of imagination around them that you can see it you know you meet somebody and there's something about them their their energy and you go what is with that person? what you want to be with that person basically just enhancing that idea so yeah. Do you have a favorite character or characters? You know, uh, that's a really good question. It's like, do I have a favorite kid? Let's see. <laughs> this one or my son? I, uh, I have lots of favorites. I, um, I think the, uh, the most enjoyable character, or, or, it was Alice because she had the biggest story arc. But you know, some days you're not in a good mood and you just want to be evil and so I'll work on red and you know, I'll just work out some frustration and then you want to have something cool, you know, some kind of, you know, you know, boyish, you know, weapon. And, um, but I think, um, I think Hatter in terms of the wow factor and Alice in terms of the real emotional kind of significant, yeah, yeah, growth or weight. So, hey guys, how's it going? You know what, doesn't matter, you can come in late. I am not affected whatsoever. You just came from the ukulele store. Oh, you did? Oh, you did? Hey, you know what, I just posted a picture of that because I was, I, I, I posted on Instagram saying, you know, what I love about Los Angeles is these hidden gems. I had no idea, coffee shop, and, and so I took a picture and, uh, and uh, told people that. So, well, thanks for stopping up. I'm the author of The Looking Glass Wars, which, um, I mean, it's a reimagining of Alice in Wonderland, and uh, I'm going to give you the 45-second version of the book that took me five years to write, okay? <laughs> All right? Now, um, I, if, if, you, if you and I were in the elevator, this is what I would say. It's about Princess Alice Hart, who's enjoying her seventh birthday, when suddenly there's a violent coup led by her evil Aunt Red. Her bodyguard, Hatter Madigan, whisks her to safety through the pool of tears. Now, the legend is it's a portal from Wonderland to our world, but no one's ever come back. Our heroes have no choice. They just jump into the pool of tears, and tragically they get separated. Alice shoots out of a puddle and she lands in Oxford, England, and she meets a young aspiring writer, Lewis Carroll, who wants to write a book about her harrowing adventure. But the guy betrays her and writes that bogus fairy tale to sell more copies or something. Can you imagine? I have been burdened with the true story. It's not so easy. Out of another puddle shoots the bodyguard. He ends up in Paris and he goes on a mad search for 13 years and he finds her. The day she's going to make the biggest mistake of her life, she's going to marry Queen Victoria's fourth son, Leopold. Can I tell you something? I googled this guy. Huge loser. Had her rescues her, brings her back to Wonderland to fight for her rightful place as the true warrior queen of Wonderland. Woo! Yes? What's your favorite book? What's my favorite book? <laughs> 
Well, I think my favorite book is the one that you wrote last week for your school. No, Do you want to tell me about it? Oh, these, okay. You insist. My favorite book is usually the last book I've written. Because when I read this, Ava, I look at all, I see, oh, I am a much better writer now. So this graphic novel, I feel, is my favorite for today. Okay? <laughs> but I hope this will be my favorite. So uh, I haven't finished it yet, but it's the prequel, so. Is there a release date for that? Book? It's coming out in March. So uh, if, you, uh, if you come down to my booth, you can get a flyer and you can pre-order if you'd like. And uh, if you're, anybody's interested in books, I'm signing and stamping the book. And the cool thing about the stamp is you can only get it here, and then you can sell it on eBay for more money later. <laughs> so. yeah, here's, here's one that I think. Um, God, all, the gods of, all the gods of mythology, from Greek mythology, Roman mythology, they... They all settled their differences and settled down in modern day, modern day suburbia, and they get entangled with each other. Like Hades is snobby lawyer type. You know, I'm doing I'm doing that in some uh, sequels where the different suit families are all vying for power and they're all conniving to see if they can take out the uh, the, the hearts because they are the ruling dynasty. And so each one of the each one of the suit families is fighting to um, to take over the throne. Yeah, but this one's more of a comedy. <laughs> oh, really? Adventure comedy. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, anybody else? How did you actually settle down on the actual art style? So I would assume um, the artists that you actually have, or at the time that we're working on each book, would give, present you, let's say, 10, 20 different concepts of art. Well, well, here's what I would do, is I would look for concept artists that, um, that were specialized in some, you know, like a lot of people specialize in environments. And then I would see, they would do a sketch. And if I liked the direction, I would have them do a piece. And if I liked the piece, they would do another. Some people are really great at weapons. And so I would go to somebody who would create really cool weapons. Um, for this, for the graphic novel, I used only two artists, Ben Templesmith, who started. And he has that you know, sort of scratchy style, um, which I love. Uh, but then Ben was so busy, I couldn't get him on a schedule. And so then I, bet, I met Sammy, and Sammy uh, uh, lives in Finland, and I really loved his style, and we've done five books together. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, he understands what I'm trying to accomplish. And when you write a graphic novel, the difference between a graphic novel, as you know, and a novel is you have to collaborate with the artist. So the artist is adding to the story by the very nature of the point of view and, um, and the number of panels. Even though I'll write five panels, sometimes he'll say, I could only fit in the art in four panels, or I have a close-up, and he goes, hey, I did, a, I did a medium shot. Where a novel is more like being, a, you know, you're a marathon runner, you're on your own, you're just trying to get to the finish line. So in this case, I use concept artists that just do concepts, um, and these concepts are people, you know, that's what happens on a movie. So you hire a team of concept artists, so when they did Guardian of the Galaxies, they had like 10 concept artists, and they would all work on some different aspects depending on their abilities and their specialty. And then the director decides, hey, I like that, let's drill down on that idea. Like this one, um, I was, I'm doing this movie at Warner Brothers, and he, we were, he was doing most of the concepts, the director kept choosing this guy's stuff from the weapons and the spaceships, because he had a, he had just a, he just has an amazing look. And so I asked him to uh, I asked him to um, do this work for me on the weekend, um, and uh, and it took him it took me about three months to talk him into doing it, and it took him another three months to actually finish it. So, so well, that's what happened with that. So it's really fun. It's like Christmas. Suddenly, a couple of you know I'll get four or five pages from the artist. There'll be pencil sketches, and then he'll add the ink, and then later the next week, all the color images come in. And once the color comes in, then I I rewrite the dialogue, and I have a letterer put in the the thought balloons or the dialogue uh, uh, balloons. So. Hey, that's my uh, that's my son, Luke Bedore. Now, I'm not saying that we're all um, like little. Look, come over here. Let me show them. <laughs> it's a family of promoters. This is a T-shirt for uh, Hatter. Um, Luke was down uh, doing a sword fighting class or some sort. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stick fighting? Yes. So, if you see this little scar uh, that's on my eye, I was in New York last year and there was a really um, shy boy. He came by my booth and so I took one of the posters and I was pretending, I got down on my knees like this and we were pretending to play sword fighting and he went to he went to stab me and I moved my head really quickly and I hit the edge of the table and he looked at me like terrified. I'm like, it's okay, it doesn't hurt that much, it's fine. And then I put my hand on my head and it was gushing blood and I had all this blood on my hand and then he looked at his dad and he started crying. <laughs> the kid was totally traumatized and I had to go get a stitch. So uh, that's what you get for uh, trying to be entertaining when you're not a stand-up comedian. <laughs> You're supposed to stand. Comedians stand, not bending down, hitting their knees. So, so anyway, um, I really appreciate it. They said that uh, my time is up. Uh, you guys were really great to have me. Um, Stephanie, thanks again for inviting me. Um, best of luck with this con. And